I'm just going to talk about something that the Sunnis or other people from maybe a non-Muslim perspective would think about when they think about Shia. So what they think about is things like Mota marriage, which maybe temporary marriage, uh, taqiyya, which is the ability for or the allowance for Shia to be able to lie yani, uh, in certain situations, and maybe potentially the, the Mahdi for the Shia is obviously different in character and description than the Mahdi for the Sunnis. Uh, and potentially they, they might be acquainted with uh, the fact that you know Shias believe that Ali should have been the successor to the Prophet and Sunnis believe that, the, uh, that Abu Bakr should have been the successor to the Prophet. When people think about the differences between Sh- Sun- Sunni and Shia, these are the kind of things that come into or crop into your mind. I want to say something to you guys. I think these are not actually the primary differences between Sunni and Shia. The primary differences between Sunni and Shia, I would say, Allah Alam, are three. Number one is the status of the Quran. Number two is the uh, Sahaba. And number three, Imama. These are three things which I would say are the pillars of difference between Sunnis and Shia. So I'm mentioning these things not to cause uh, a fitna or corruption in the land or something like this. I'm mentioning these things because it's the right of the consumer to understand these differences when conceptualizing Islam in general. Now, the first thing we're going to talk about quickly is the Quran. Now, the Quran clearly is, Muslims believe, sent down to the Prophet Muhammad by the angel Gabriel, etc. I have to be honest that when you look into the classical Shia scholarship, uh, it's very clear that there's a difference of opinion between the scholars in, Shia, in the Shia school of thought uh, especially the 12th uh, Shia school of thought, as it relates to the preservation of the Quran. So there are these who take the, the Islamic position that the Quran is preserved and sent down the Prophet, and those Shia who basically don't take the Islamic position, uh, and this is in their scholarship, and they don't basically believe that the Quran is preserved because they don't see that the Sahaba or the companions have done a good job in preserving the Quran. Clearly now, those who have the opinion that the Quran is preserved, which I genuinely believe are the majority. We can then talk about the second uh, thing which we're going to segue into now uh, with a bit more uh, conviction. Number two here is the status of the Sahaba. The Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet. Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah describe a Sahabi as someone who has met the Prophet and he's a, he was a Muslim or she was a Muslim and then died upon this, i.e. Islam. Now, from a Sunni perspective, the Sahaba are seen as the transmitters of the, the revelation, by both the Quran and the Sunnah. If we do take the Shia position, which I'm going to outline in a second, then we would, if we take our skeptical extreme to its max, we could actually say that the Quran would be corrupted. But having said this, what do the Shia say? If you look at Al-Kafi, which is the second most authoritative book for the uh, for Shia, you'll find that it says in Al-Kafi, the companions of the Prophet, that they were uh, apostates except for three, and they mention who the three are, uh, and they say it was Al-Maqdad, and it was Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, and it was Salman al-Farisi. These are the three uh, companions which are not apostates, according to uh, the Shia tradition. Of course, in addition to Ahlul Bayt, who are the immediate family, of the Prophet, who they would say is Hassan, Hussein, Fatima, etc. Now, these are big differences here because, once again, if you concede that the Sahaba are kuffar, uh, and this is exactly what one of the Shia scholars says in one of his books, and he, he entitled one of the, uh, the chapters Kufr al uh, Thalatha, some Shia make specific takfir to Abu Bakr, Amr. And Uthman, they make specific takfir to these three, meaning that they say that these people are not Muslims because they usurped Ali from his rightful the successorship of the Prophet. This is basically the Shia position. So, once again, if you take this position, you could fall into 
the first category of people who denied the Quran's preservation. But in addition to that, a, there are lots of other problems. Like for example, if you look at the life of Ali ibn Abi Talib, he didn't come out uh, and say to, to these three successors, to Abu Bakr, Amr, and Uthman, that I believe you are kuffar. And this is not in their, in, in their books, and neither is in our books. I mean, if you look carefully, he actually prays behind those people. And in Islam, if you pray behind the disbeliever, your prayer is invalid. In fact, more than that, he, Ali had two sons. He had more than two sons, sorry. But I mean, two sons who he specifically named Abu Bakr and Umar. Uh, in addition to that, you know, Ali had uh, married his daughter to Umar al Khattab, Umm Kuthum. So he married her off to uh, this man. And clearly, if this uh, was a disbeliever, then it wouldn't be a legitimate marriage in Islam. These are some things which Sunnis would reply and say, look, this is your, the, the issue with your thesis, yeah? or the thesis that the Sahaba are not uh, basically uh, Muslim. Having said this also, the Qur'an makes it clear. If we look at Surah Al-Fatih, chapter number 48 of the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself, he says, Allah is pleased with those people who have made bay'ah to you under the tree. Bay'ah means the pledge of allegiance. And there's no difference of opinion that these individuals included Uthman and included Abu Bakr and these big names that basically the Sunnis take as big names and the Shias, some of them, I would say, quite openly, excommunicate from the faith altogether. And there are other verses, like in the final verse of that very chapter, chapter 48, it says Muhammad Rasulullah and the ones who have believed with him are uh, good traits, we would say, of the Sahaba. Having said that, having spoken about the second major difference, I'll talk now about the third major difference. The third major difference is, and it's a very big one, Imama. Now, Imama, if you look at the Islamic tradition, you'll find that Muslims all agree there are six pillars of Iman. There are five pillars of Islam, six pillars of Iman. That you believe in Allah and His, mes- and his angels and His messengers, etc., etc., etc. Yeah? There are six pillars of Iman, which is faith. Now, we would consider these six pillars of faith as, the, you would say, the pillars or the... Um, foundations of our creedal belief. Shias now have an addition to this. What they say is that we believe in imama. Imama is the idea that there are 12 imams. Imams means, kind of, linguistically means leaders or people to be followed. There are 12 imams beginning with Ali ibn Abi Talib and ending with uh, Muhammad ibn Hassan Askari that all of these 12 imams are number one infallible that they're incapable of making mistakes. Number two, that they have all knowledge. Number three, that they can control of the dharrat, even the atoms of creation, they can have control of it. And so on and so forth. So these 12 Imams, according to the Shia, are incredibly perfect. They are perfect in every way, shape and form. And we have to follow them, according to Shia, in order to seek to get salvation. Now, the question that Sunnis pose to Shia is now is, if we look at the Qur'an, from the beginning of the Qur'an to the end of the Qur'an, we will, we will find many mentions, not just one mention, but many mentions of all of the foundational elements of, uh, of Aqidah or Faith. But when you try and do the same thing for Imamah, the question now is, where does the Qur'an mention Imamah? From the beginning of it to the end of it. Now clearly, those, these may be classical-minded Shias, Orthodox uh, Shias, or whatever you want to call them, they will say maybe the Qur'an is not preserved, the original Qur'an had 18,000 verses and you know, uh, therefore you know, that those verses that talk about Imam you know, have been lifted. But for those Shias who maintain that the Qur'an is preserved and that the Qur'an has not been changed, which hopefully I will say is the majority, the question now is how would they respond to, to the fact that Imam or the idea of uh, the leadership of the Twelve um, is not mentioned anywhere in the Qur'an in any explicit way at all. And this is very, very clear for all to see. So this is a question that Sunnis have been historically posing to Shias for a very, very long time. And Shias have been uh, grappling with it. And you could say that they've been re- referencing some ayat, maybe in Surah Al-Ma'idah, uh, some ayat in other places which have vague references or ambiguous references. Uh, which are not clear and definitely don't mention any of the names of any of the 12 Imams beginning from Ali ibn Abi Talib and ending with Muhammad uh, ibn Hassan al-Askari but having said this the question now would be where did the idea come from? 
that one theory, according to uh, some people, uh, Shia and Sunnah actually, the idea of Imam actually came from a human being called Abdullah ibn Saba. And I hope the Shia, <laughs> if you're watching this, you're not going to switch off and get angry because I know you've heard this probably before. Okay? I know you've heard this before. I'm not trying to say that it's true or it's false. I'm just saying it's an idea. It's in the scholarly works of Shias and Sunnah. For example, Abdullah ibn Saba has been said by someone called Al Qummi, who is a Shia scholar, who wrote a book called uh, Firaq al Shia. This is exactly what he says in page 32. He says that he, i.e., Abdullah ibn Saba, is the first person to. Uh, say that it's obligatory to believe in the imama, and he uses exactly the word imama of Ali, and he says alayhi salam because he is a Shia, uh, and uh, there have been Sunnis who have said the same thing. Alayhi salam is not necessarily something I'm uh, attacking anyone on. He is the first person to really show animosity against those who people who uh, who he said are the enemies of Ali, who he he's referring to obviously Omar, Abu Bakr, etc. And this is one theory, and certainly it's been mentioned by Sunnis and Shia. But there are other theories, and um, I'm not here to make, have you know have a complete discussion about that. But it's important for us to know not only the differences, but perhaps where the differences came from as well. But another issue is really a creedal issue. If we say that that the Imam, for example, knows everything, this is what Khomeini says. This is what many of the scholars, classical and contemporary, have said about the Imams. They know everything. If this is the case, as some Sunnis have argued, then would that suggest that they are more knowledge than the Prophet Muhammad? So they'll say, no, in fact, the Prophet Muhammad knows everything as well. Say, so, okay, fine. Let's take this and let's put it to the standard of the Quran. You see, the Quran in chapter number 46, verse number 8, it says, to the Prophet Muhammad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, he says to the Prophet Muhammad, say, I'm not an innovation of the Prophet, so I'm not something new, not coming with a new message. And I don't know what's going to happen to me, and I don't know what's going to happen to you. So he says, I don't know something. For example, chapter 79 of the Quran, the last couple of verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they ask you about the hour, when will it be pegged? Say, who are you? Who are you, O Prophet Muhammad sallallahu uh, to know this kind of information? It says that we haven't taught him sha'r, which means poetry. So there's lots of things the Prophet doesn't know. The question would then remain, if we're saying that the Imams know everything and that Allah knows everything then does that mean that the Imams have the same knowledge as Allah? Or not? But this is another argument that, that, that Sunnis put forward. Now the Shia does have a counter to this just to be clear and remember this is an education video if we say that Allah knows everything and that the Imams know everything that would suggest that they have the same knowledge. Now the Shia would come about and say look actually that's not true uh, you're conceptualizing it incorrectly. So why? There's a reason why actually there's something that the Allah has that the Imams don't have. Which is what you call Samadiyah. A Samad means that everything relies upon Allah and Allah doesn't rely upon anyone. Whereas the Imams all rely upon Allah and uh, the Allah does not rely upon the Imams. That's why they say this is, a, this is a clear difference. This is what differentiates the Imams from the Prophet Muhammad, from the Prophet Muhammad and from the Imams. Say so fine. But that does not negate the fact that you, you are saying that they have the same knowledge. Just, just because one is more reliant than the other, or one is reliant on the other and the other is not reliant on one, doesn't mean that they don't have the same knowledge if you subscribe to this belief. So this is the kind of um, discussion you'll find between Sunni and Shia. This is the traditional discussion that's been going on for many, many uh, hundreds of And it's important for us as consumers of the truth to have an, an understanding of that. I hope you haven't offended anybody. I just genuinely did this because I felt there was a need to um, to educate people.